Hey everybody, how you doing? We're back today to talk about um, Brennan's lawyers uh, filing their brief in response to the state's original brief in the state's appeal of um, Brennan Dassey's overturned conviction. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about. This is Laura Nye Ryder, uh, the brief that she prepared for the Seventh Circuit Court um, in response to the first brief filed by the state. So, or Brad Schimmel. So, anyway. Um, it's funny, she immediately pretty much starts out by talking, by saying, um, how much the, the state, just their narrative of what happened is just so ridiculous and it doesn't really work. But she goes on to say that it, pretty much the first line of the introduction is the appellant's narrative in the rape and the murder of Teresa Halbach presented to this court, um, in its statement of case is spun of pure fiction, <laughs> you know, powerful words. Um, and I love how she just lays it right out there immediately. Like, you know, she just doesn't mince words. She's just like, yeah, it's, you, you read that thing, right? You saw how ridiculous that was, right? You know, <laughs> anyways, um, she, uh, she points out that, um, most of that narrative that, that they're drawing that, you know, that narrative, mo most of what they drew that from was the March 1st confession. Um, and the fact of the matter is that the March 1st confession is no longer part of the record. It's been thrown out. Um, so it's not even part of the record here, um, which I, you know, think is interesting. So th it's basically like they didn't have any other way to tell a story. So they just had to keep telling the one they've been telling. And it just so happens that that one, that story they've been telling comes from that, that March 1st confession. So it'd be interesting to see how things go. Uh, when these judges review this case. But anyways, she goes on to say that in the absence of any evidence, the police fed Brendan um, basically their own theories of what they thought occurred. Um, and they did it in subtle ways. You know, we all know they were they were just like whenever they were trying to to get him to say something specific, they would start saying, you know, like, you know, come on, be honest, Brendan, you know, tell the truth, Brendan. You know, and they would use those sort of tactics and, and everything. And she goes into the way that they use the tactics to basically, like, put pressure on Brendan and get him to say certain things specifically. And then taking the pressure off Brendan um, to try to get him to relax and, and maybe offer up some little thing. Like, you know, it's it, like they were just using these tactics to kind of keep him off balance and, and everything. It's really sad. But um, she kind of talks about all that. But... Mainly, she starts to talk about how many of the details in Brendan's confession um, were later proven false, and that his confession really almost completely, totally relaxed any corroboration. Um, and she's right, because it, it doesn't. A lot of the things, most of the stuff he said is, is unproven. Um, there's no proof of any rape. That's, there's no proof of any of that stuff. There's no proof, there's no blood. As Sean Atwood likes to say, where's the blood, Brad Schimmel? Where's the blood? Anyways, so, you know, there's certain, there's a lot of problems in this case. And and for the, the people involved here to continue acting like there is nothing wrong with it, that there's not, there's not these glaring, obvious problems is ridiculous. But anyway, we'll go into the first thing here where it's 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 an eye writer. This is the document. This is actually the brief um, where we're going to see her talking about certain aspects of what Brendan said that were later proven false. So here it comes. How about many, de many details in Brendan's confession were later proven false. Brendan accepted the police's theory that Hallback was raped in Avery's bedroom, for instance, and added that she was shackled to the wooden headboard. But the headboard bore no scratches or marks, and technicians found no DNA from Halbach or Brendan in the bedroom. Similarly, Brendan agreed that Halbach's bleeding body was placed on a creeper, but no blood or DNA was found on that creeper. These discrepancies also signify unreliability. The vast majority of proven, <clears throat> proven false confessors made statements in their interrogations that were contradicted by crime scene evidence. Indeed, no forensic evidence tied Brennan to the crime, despite one of the biggest investigations in Wisconsin's history. 
All right, and we're back. So you saw some of the things where she points out there. She just brings up the the first off the confession is just riddled with contradictions. Um, first, Teresa's shirt was white, and then it was black. You know, I mean, it doesn't get any more contrasted than black and white, right? Am I right? Anyway, so I mean, that's pretty pretty different things that he said. You know, so pretty crazy, but. And then we move on to what happens after, after the confession and stuff, you know, he, he actually is asking, you know, can I get returned to school for sixth hour? Cause I have a project due and he's informed that he's going to be on, un, he's under arrest and he's not going to be able to do that. He's not gonna be able to go to school today. And then he asks, is it only for one day? Okay. Clearly somebody that does not understand the gravity of what was going on. Somebody that, obviously, and if you listen to the part when, when Barb comes in and he actually says, they got to my head, you can see he thought that that he was doing what they wanted and he's just finding out that they were only doing that to lead him into the pit, you know? So, it's really sad. But, anyways, but clearly he did not understand, you know, what was happening there. She then talks about, you know, Brendan's low IQ and his, um, um, you know, uh, significantly more, significant more susceptibility to, um, suggest suggestion or suggestibility. He's very, you know, he's very, you know, he, he can, he can be plied and, and, and prodded and 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 can get be you know can be convinced to go along with um things kind of easily cuz he's he just has that suggestibility that um that and it's strong in him stronger than it would be probably for normal folks so especially at 16 you know especially then when he's that young so um the next thing we're going to go into here now is going to be um, from February 27th, it's going to be basically like the opening monologue of um, <laughs> Fassbender and Weger, um at the open opening of the interrogation on the on February 27th. Um, and the, they do these these monologues with Brennan. I'll, I'll get to it when we get to the March 1st um, uh, interrogation, um, where the, we're all I'll comment more on these monologues, but. Anyway, that's what this is going to be. It's going to be the opening thing that Fassbender says, a long, long, long-winded paragraph, um, and then another thing that that Weger basically, as soon as Fassbender stops talking, Weger jumps in with what he jumps in here. So you'll see that right now, coming up. Interrogators confronted Brendan with a lie. Hallbach's bones, they claimed, were found intermingled in the van seat. <clears throat> Officer answering no to, did you find any bone fragments in the fan, in the van seat? The only way her bones were intermingled in that seat, they announced, is if she was put on that seat or if the seat was put on top of her. La- Fassbender launches into a monologue. You're a kid. You know, we got, we got people back at the sheriff's department, district attorney's office, and they're looking at this now saying there's no way that Brendan Dassey was out there and didn't see something. They're talking about trying to link Brendan Dassey with this event. They're not saying that Brendan did it. They're saying that Brendan had something to do with it, or 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 that the or the cover up of it, with which would mean Brendan Dassey could potentially be facing charges for that. And Mark and I are both going, well, uh, he's a kid. He had nothing to do with this. And whether Steve got him out there to help build a fire, and he inadvertently saw some things, that's what it would be. It wouldn't be that Brendan had act, you know, actually helped him dispose of this body. And I'm looking at you, Brendan, and I know you saw something. And that's what's killing you more than anything else. Some people don't care. Some people back there say, no, we'll, no, we'll just charge him. We said, no, let's talk to him and give him the opportunity to come forward with the information that he has. Get it off of his chest. Now... Make it look. You can make it look however you want. Mark and I, yeah, we're cops. We're investigators and stuff like that. But I'm I'm not right now. I'm a father that has a kid your age. 
There's nothing I'd like more than to come over and give you a big hug because I know you're hurting. Talk about it. I promise I will not leave you high and dry. Wiegert followed. I find I find it quite difficult to believe that if there was a body in that fire, Brendan, that you wouldn't have seen something like a hand or a foot, a head, hair, something, okay? We know you saw something. Eventually, Brendan agreed that he had seen the very body parts in the fire, fingers, toes, and a forehead, as well as a belly. Weger continued, Now, I have been told that you and Steve talked about Talked about the body in there, okay? That's what I was told, and I believe that you, I believe that you guys did talk about it, didn't you? Yeah, Brendan agreed. Did he try to have sex with her or anything? And then she said no. Asked Fassbender, introducing the idea of sexual assault occurred. No, Brendan said, but he did agree that Avery had said she was pretty. The interrogators had him write out a statement took him to the nearby police department where he repeated his, his statement on videotape and then took him to a hotel where they questioned him a third time in an, in an unrecorded interview. All right, so there you see in that final paragraph of Wiegert there um, that he clearly introduces the narrative of rape. It wasn't So it's obviously not something that ben, Brennan just brought up on his own. Um, so he clearly introduces that idea and that narrative. Um, he goes, he says, did Steven try to have sex with her or anything like that? And did she say no? Um, to which Brendan, you know, says no or whatever, but he does eventually agree that Steven did say she was pretty. So, um, far cry from sex or rape, but anyway, so, um, she then inclu includes in the brief right there again another pretty much another monologue from um, Fassbender and and Wiegert. Um but this is on March first at the opening of the March first uh, interrogation and brought this up a minute ago. These monologues I don't know if you've seen my other video um, I've done a few videos about quite a few videos about Brendan but a while back I did a video. Um, titled, Did, Did L.E. Plant a Band-Aid in the RAV4? Um, in that, I go kind of over the uh, February 27th and March 1st confessions and stuff. And, and at the beginning of that confession, it's amazing to me. Because they're sitting there telling Brendan about, we want to give you the opportunity to speak here, Brendan. We want to give you the opportunity to, say, to tell your story, to say what, what happened. And we want to just, we want to give you the opportunity to talk with, without, you know, us having to, or, you know, get involved or too much or whatever, you know, kind of thing. And, and they're, and so they're in these monologues and they're, they each go through about two or three of them at the beginning of the, um, interview. And what they're essentially doing is, is they're, they're setting up the kind of framework uh, of the narrative that they're basically trying to lead him down a path. Um, they're kind of letting him know what they are kind of expecting um, in my opinion, I mean, these monologues are ridiculous. I mean, they're, they're just talking and talking and talking and, 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 tr and saying about how much they want. They want to let Brennan talk and the, and pretty much the first chance Brennan gets to talk, they interrupt him with another monologue. Anyways, if you see my other video about did L.E. plant the bandaid in the rap floor, you, you'll see that. Um, I have those documents in that video, uh, where you can see that they were doing that. Um, but they were basically just setting up the outline for their narrative, totally grooming him, essentially, for the confession they were trying to get out of him. Um, so then she she then puts in um, examples of them adjusting Brendan's statements, like where he will say, um, well, he would say one thing, but they didn't like that. So then they would actually say, oh, well, did that really happen, Brendan, or did it? Blah, 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 blah. And, and, you know, they would get him questioning himself, obviously, and get him, get him to realize that he was saying something they didn't want him to say. And since he was trying to tell them what they wanted to hear because he thought that was how he was going to get to six periods so he could turn in his project, he changed his story and, and amended it, or you know, and, and told a slightly different story. I mean, she so she points out some things of how they were doing that. Um talking about how they were doing the, the be honest, tell the truth, um, all those sort of things. Um, you know, and then there's the whole situation about the whole thing about shooting in the head. I mean, 
that's the one thing that if Brendan would have been would have come up with that on his own, it would have it would have been it would have seemed very damning. But he didn't. He was guessing at what they wanted and he couldn't realize he didn't when he says I that part of the interview is very very interesting to me because he doesn't say because I didn't remember or because I was or or because I was afraid or scared or whatever. He says because I couldn't think of it. Because I couldn't think of it. That's that's him basically telling them, I'm sorry, I guessed wrong. I didn't know what you wanted me to say. That's what that's to me what that statement means. Um, because it's an odd statement. Most people would say like something like I said, like oh, oh I don't I didn't remember or, or I had forgotten or I wasn't thinking about it or something like that. But to say to say what he said of I couldn't think of it that's him saying I was guessing, but I couldn't. I didn't. I was. I guessed wrong, and, and that's the way that comes off to me. So then she goes. So then now we're going to move in here with the with the document here where she starts saying from her brief, um, and where it, she basically starts launching into Lynn Lynn Kachinsky, as I like to call him, Kachinsky, because he's very Kachinsky with the defense. Um, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, anyway, so we'll start with that, with the document here where she's talking about Lynn Kaczynski, Kaczynski, uh, anyways, and then we'll come back. Throughout Kaczynski's representation, Brendan repeatedly told him <clears throat> that he was innocent and had falsely confessed. Because he thought Brendan should plead guilty, however, Kaczynski directed his private investigator, Michael O'Kelly, to compel Brendan to confess again. Over email, Kaczynski and O'Kelly agreed that O'Kelly would interrogate Brendan in jail on May 12, 2006, the same day on which Kaczynski expected to lose his motion to suppress Brendan's March 1st confession because the blow of the loss would render Brendan more vulnerable. Kaczynski and O'Kelly also agreed that Kaczynski would would cancel his upcoming visit with Brendan to make him feel more alone. Kaczynski made these plans despite receiving an email in which O'Kelly called Brendan, Brendan's family truly where the devil resides in comfort. I can, I can find no good in any, in any member. These people are pure evil. A friend of mine suggested that this is a one branch family tree. Cut, the tree, cut this tree down. We need to end the gene pool here. Very disturbing, extremely disturbing. Okay, so there we see what some of the, some, some of what Laura had to say about Len uh, Kachinsky. Um, anyways, um, you know, Kachinsky said Brendan was guilty from the start. I mean, he he was never interested in helping Brendan, and that was pretty clear. Although it did seem he was pretty interested in getting some media spotlight out of it. Um, uh, how that guy was made a judge eventually, I have no idea. But anyway, at least it's only in traffic court. Um, anyway, um, then he goes ahead and brilliantly, I mean, I say brilliantly, but I mean, it's horrific. But he orchestrates it so that on the day that Brendan gets his his motion to try to have the confession um, be made inadmissible or to have it thrown out and not used at trial, the day that he was basically going to find out that that he that it was going to be used in the trial is the day that he set up for O'Kelly to hit him and and scare the you know heck out of him um, and get him to confess again. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable. And then after you know, and and upon doing that, they get they they bully him into confessing again. And then they set him up where, you know, without any kind of a plea deal or any kind of an assurance w from the prosecution or anything, Len Kaczynski sets up, uh, you know, an interview with Wiegert and Fassbender and throws Brennan to the wolves. <laughs> I mean, wow. You know, so she's talking about how all these things all culminated into a very big problem. Um, and it all came about because O'Kelly was making... He was basically making another sort of promise to Brennan 
trying to tell Brendan what he wanted to hear to get him to do what he want what to get Brendan to do what he wanted and so he was he was using the carrot of well if you can if you you know confess or whatever and say you're sorry well then you might only do 20 years and you can get out and still have a family or whatever and 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 that's clear because he actually says that in the call to Barb word for word but so this is what O'Kelly was telling Brendan, but there was no, there was no plea deal or assurances. There was none of that. It was a lie a complete fabrication, total lie. So, you know, what ends up happening is, is that he, he gets interviewed by Fassbender and we get, and we know they tell him to call his mother and tell her because that would be on the prison phone. They tell him that he needs to tell his mother, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, and then on the prison phone, we have Brendan calling her to tell her that he did, you know, some of it and whatever. And that call ended up getting used in court. Number one, it got used to refute his Brendan's own testimony by the prosecution. It was used again when the um, expert for the defense testified as to Brendan's low IQ and suggestibility. It was used... Um, basically to kind of answer or discredit him. And it was also used in closing arguments. It was used three times. <clears throat> the appeals court that first reviewed Brendan's case, Brendan's case, essentially, yeah, um, deemed that... They deemed that the the using of that phone call was fine because it was only used once. And here's an eye writer pointing out, um, excuse me, that call was used three times and and you know it it's i it's obviously questionable that that call should have been used that many times um otherwise she wouldn't bring it up obviously but but i think it's kind of i mean me personally i think it's a little bit unfair because we all know how it came about um and and we know how brendan was prodded and pushed into doing it um but yeah, I mean, it was used three times instead of just one time, like the court tried to say it was. Why would the court? Why would the court try to change the story? Tra- you know, why would they try to claim it was only once when it was used three times? You got to ask yourself that question too. Um, so anyway, well, she basically goes on, kind of, you know, talking about all the shady stuff of Lichinsky, but mainly that part because. That phone call would have never, ever, ever come into existence or ever, ever happened if it wasn't for Brendan's own lawyer, his own defense counsel, turning on him and throwing him to the wolves. Basically, the absolute opposite of what the heck he should have been doing. So, like I said, I don't know how the guy is ending up being a judge today, but I'm glad it's only in traffic court so that he couldn't, you know, bungle anything more serious. Um, anyways, so that's about it. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys the last little thing here. It's just basically the end, her final paragraph of the brief, um, and her signature at the bottom. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, uh, here, the, my little review of, of the, of, uh, Brendan's lawyer's, uh, brief, uh, to the seventh circuit court. Um, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe down below and thank you very much for watching. As argued Supra, Kaczynski's disloyalty is properly viewed as a conflict that adversely affected Brendan's trial when the state used the May 13th call to undercut Brendan's false confession defense and alibi. Tainted by the fruit of conflict, the trial represented a breakdown in the adversarial process that warrants habeas relief. <clears throat> Indeed, Brendan Dassey's conviction is dogged by the question of unreliability at every turn. The district court was rightly troubled by the state court's unreasonable adjudication of this case and granted habeas relief. Petitioner Apelli respectfully asked this court to affirm. Respectfully submitted on this sixth day of December 2016, Laura H. Nyrider.